Great. Hello, everybody. We're back. Um, we just came running from Blab, so we were a little bit beat, beat up by that experience. But we're going to get right into engagement here. So this is uh, another um, session here. We're going to talk to David Amerland, and we have a very special guest, uh, Gina Fidel, today with us as well. And the subject of the discussion today is going to be uh, chapter 7 or step 7 in David's uh, exceptionally useful and helpful book called SEO Help, uh, which he wrote a year ago. And um, it has 20 steps that helps just about any business uh, do much, much better in terms of uh, SEO. And today we're talking about step number 7, which is engagement. And so I wanted to welcome, welcome David, welcome Gina. Hi, guys. Hey. And um, we're going to kind of get into the a little bit of a meat um, dealing with engagement because if you, if you look at the situation with how things are done online or even offline, doesn't matter how you do it, um, it's impossible. We talked about trust just recently you know, from David's new book on trust. It's impossible to conduct business with anybody unless you're, um, you can trust people or people can trust you to conduct business with you. And to be able to have this level of trust, initially it might be implicit to some degree, but really it takes time to establish trust and to be able to trust each other and, and thus be able to, to do business. And the only way you can actually establish this trust is by time is one element. Second element is the engagement. You need to be able to get and talk to people. You need to be able to have their thoughts and their desires given to you. You need to be able to explain to them who you are and, and what you're all about. And that, that's basically part of the major part of the mix that creates trust. And of course, trust turns into business. So it, it's an essential element. But there's different ways how engagement can be done. And that's what, what we want to talk about today is specifically what engagement is, different forms of engagement, Sometimes engagement is good, sometimes engagement is bad, especially online. So we'll talk about all of this. David? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Interesting. So um, let's start. I think the introduction you gave is, is pretty good, really. We have reached a stage on the web now where things are maturing. We are becoming more and more knowledgeable as digital um, citizens, if you like. We understand our actions better. We understand the actions of those around us a little bit better. <clears throat> and we always know when we're being marketed to and when marketers expect us to do things. Um, you know, the classic example, you know, uh, like this if you agree and there's some obvious statement like, you know, the sun rises from the east. Well, yeah, I mean, it does. And you think, why? Why should I spend time doing this simply because you put it there, simply because you are trolling for likes, for instance. And I think that is um, the case with a lot of blatant marketing where it attracts it, it tries to attract eyeballs, for instance, with clickbait um, content. It tries to attract um, plus ones and likes with content which, again, is very poor in quality, but we're being invited for some reason to actually engage with it so that somebody else can gain some kind of validation through that interaction engagement. Um, we are on the web out of choice. We have chosen to be here, so everybody here has some kind of intent. Uh, some are here to socialize and some are here to find work or sell things or connect with people and because we are multi-layered human beings a lot of us are here for a lot of all these reasons and a lot more behind them. So it's really important now to start delaying all these things and getting to the sort of things that matter. Engagement always matters on the web because from a purely um, algorithmic point of view uh, search engines look at the activity around um, an item of data, whether that item of data is a piece of content on website or the website itself or a, part, a particular post from a profile <clears throat> and they analyze in detail now what happens to that piece of data, who saw it, for how long, how long they stay there, what they do next, what is that person usually um, associated with, um, what did that person do, um, when they commented, what they usually comment about. So basically it becomes a very nuanced um, kind of assessment and because it's so nuanced it has two things we need to bear in mind. 
it is massive in terms of everything happens across the web. So it means it only moves the dial of trust and trustworthiness by tiny degrees. And secondly, um, it is it has to, to happen over a long period of time. So if you're hoping, for instance, now to game the system by saying, I've got a thousand friends and I'll pay them ten bucks. So I'm gonna put a post up and my thousand friends are going to like it and share it with all their friends, and surely that is enough. But if your post is about, for instance, uh, you know, finance and your friends don't usually react to those posts. Now if they do, it is deprecated significantly because Google thinks, okay, you know, there's, a, there's something fishy going on here. These people are acting out of character. So basically search engines are becoming as nuanced and aware in terms of our interactions as we would be in a real life environment. We say, that's out of character. So that strikes me as wrong. Therefore, I don't trust it. Therefore, that kind of engagement is false and it doesn't count. Okay. Why the? Yeah, Oops, go on. No, 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 go ahead. I didn't mean to try. I just wanted to ask a question, but that's quickly get done. Why is that really important to us right now? Well, it is because in order for us to actually get real engagement, we need two things. We need real content, and by that I don't mean content that has to win literary awards or be fantastic in terms of how it's constructed. It has to be content that actually resonates with the intended audience. It is exactly what they're looking for. It does something for them. It solves. The problem, it answers a question, it opens up their mind, it helps them understand something. And then we need real interaction on the back of that content, which means we need, really need to connect with people who care about it and um, the content matters to them. Okay, so let me ask you some hard questions, David. Okay, uh, okay. One question would be, okay, we know that people are different. You know, there's different mm -hmm. levels yeah. of there's different cultures, different languages. I mean, there's all kinds of different people are different. So yeah. with that being the case, and also you know, you yourself always preach, and I totally concur that everybody needs to be themselves since everybody yes. else is taken. So you need to really be yourself when you do any kind of engagement, interaction with people, and things like that. So with that being the case, when you're trying to create something that generates some sort of engagement with you. How do you approach the concept of dealing with different kinds of people who may have a completely different set of likes and desires and triggers, if you will, that will engage back with you? Okay, isn't that an interesting question now? You're right, it is a difficult one. And here's how we do it. I mean, the obvious and wrong answer here is to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to begin chunking up my audience into people whose motivations I think I understand, and I'm going to pander to them. So basically, I'm going to have, what do these people like? Cut, cuts, for instance, cut gifts, great. Every Monday, I'm going to post three cut gifts, and they're going to go in that, in that kind of group. And then the other kind of group is going to do that. Now, if you do this, and there's nothing particularly wrong with this. It's just not going to get you where you want to. Um, yes, you will get some kind of engagement. Yes, you will get some kind of um, superficial validation in terms of what we call the social proof on the web, in terms of engagement, where you show you know, 10,000 likes, 1,000 plus ones. <clears throat> but that will not allow you to shift the needle towards the kind of trustworthiness which allows further relational exchanges to take place. And what do we mean by that? Well, at the end of the day, if you're in business, and we're talking about a business environment and business intent here, what you need are conversions. You need people who will actually bring you customers because they are ecstatic about what you do, or they will become your customers. And that kind of approach is so cheap and cheapening that it has very little value and that won't work. So what will work? How can you be yourself when you yourself are fairly unique, as you say, in your right? And you know that everybody else is unique as well. <clears throat> well, at the end of the day, the overlap between uniqueness and humanity is quite significant. And that's where we actually begin to create connections with other people. We, we do it through showing, perhaps, what is important to us in terms of values in what we do. We do it by contextualizing the quality of the service we do and explaining how we do it in a very human way. We do it by showing the human <coughs> connection and the human passion and need behind the uh, services which we provide and the businesses we run. And that becomes an increasing connection with the audience, which then allows a conversation to take place. And one of two things happen. Sometimes trust is fairly instant because the connection is so strong and recognizable. At other times, the connection happens, a relationship is built, which over time it leads to a certain trustworthiness between the two, 
and um, that again leads to business uh, coming away. Okay, so now let's look at the engagement from a different perspective. You know, people obviously write whatever they write, they can write whatever they want, they, and, and they write whatever they want because they can, so that's, you know, leaves the, the situation where sometimes people react, you know, from the, from the hip, so to speak. Ooh. And yesterday, for example, yes. I had somebody who has some knowledge about me, but not really any kind of in-depth knowledge about me, and um, that person just happened to be posting something that had to do with politics, and the um, bottom line is there were words exchanged from that person to me in some of the comments saying things like, a uh, few words that you remember were illogical, condescending, and um, what was the other word she used? Oh, yeah, ended them wrong, okay? And for me personally, you know, I don't have any problems with people disagreeing with me. I mean, I have no problems at all. But uh, when people tell me that I'm wrong, then that totally, as far as I'm concerned, crossing the line, they don't know that I'm wrong any more than I know that they're wrong. So with that, you know, that's getting philosophical. But what I'm trying to drive here at is on the engagement part itself, by the way, I wasn't condescending or illogical for the record. Um, the, the part itself is this deal with engagement being a very personal thing, the way you engage yourself, and then the reasons why you engage. In, in other words, sometimes you engage with people on the personal level, sometimes you engage on the business level. I think on the business level it's much easier because it's easier to deal in that realm. But when you yes. start getting, getting into a personal engagement, then things potentially can fall apart, and that's what I wanted perhaps you and then maybe Gina can address that as well to see how in her experience these kind of things work out. Well, this is exactly why social media is such a minefield and why it has historically now uh, wrong-footed so many businesses and so many large corporations and forced them to begin to change internally. Let's take at the level of the individual because on the individual level it appears easier because you only have to manage yourself if you're a business person, you do one thing as a business, and then if you're you, you know, you do things like as you. So you think this is easy to manage. I understand my business and understand myself. And uh, the truth is that it doesn't quite work that way because, as you said, you know, you can post something with the best intention in mind because, you know, you post a, you put up a post. You, you know, we don't know what made you do it. You could be you feeling good about yourself. It could be that particular time you want to get something specific out there, and then somebody comes and. We don't know why they chose to engage the way they did. They engage in a very adversarial way, as you explain, and then you have to respond. And that's when things become interesting because at the end of the day, because it's a very public arena, people won't remember the specifics of what you posted, um, who said what, who started it, you know, how the whole thing escalated. What they'll remember a week, a day, a month, a year later is your response to it, your type of response. And if you come across really heavy-handed, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, they will remember that you're really heavy-handed and, ooh, you're not really the kind of person they want to know because, you know, you came across overly, overbearingly aggressive. Even though, in this particular context, you may be 100% in the right. And this shows, again, how businesses can sometimes overreact to something and they get wrong-footed because then we see that because they overreact they have systems in place which basically um, devalue the individual are not willing to take everything into account and that then begins to affect their reputation affects the way we perceive them which then has a, a knock-on effect on the on the way on our willingness to do business with them so to get back to that the yeah, question is, I suppose, or should be, how do you engage in a very public arena like this? And because it's a question that comes up again and again in a corporate setting, I actually have a, a guideline for this, which I'm going to share with you. And I always tell everybody, you're on social media, as a business or as an individual, you engage exactly the same way you would if you were in your grandma's living room. And what's acceptable there should be acceptable on that platform. And that immediately has... Um, a uh, sort of um, depressurizing effect in the emotions in place because you realize that you know you wouldn't say some things in your grandmother's living room no matter how passionately uh, you got worked up and and you know you would try to be in your best behavior and that may seem contradictory to what I normally say about be yourself but it isn't I think uh, being ourselves really being ourselves should really come as being the best selves we can all possibly be always. 
um, it's very easy for any of us, each of us, to be you know complete, um, completely bad um, entities or people to deal with, because we can just let all the angst and anxiety and fears and repressions just come out. But that's the one makes us great individuals. Okay, I, I don't completely agree with this, but I want Gina to chime in here and see what she <laughs> Okay, this is getting I, interesting. Unfortunately, Oleg, I, I do agree. <laughs> I, what I find is that context is everything, and context isn't only what a post is about or where the post is or whether you're there representing your business or you're being just yourself, personal. There's always a different context with each individual that you're engaging with on that post. So one of the one of the ch kind of challenges almost that I have is that I'm very comfortable being myself. I'm also very aware of the level of caution that I carry with me all the time when I'm online because I do feel that I need to talk in a particular way to each particular person because everybody's going to hear me differently and I might say something to you Oleg in a joking in a joking way that you'll pick up on that tone, but the next person in the thread, if I were to speak to them that way, which is also being myself with them, they may not understand it. So there's so much that has to do with paying attention and listening to who it is you're engaging with. And I sometimes, I don't know how to express that. I'll, I'll take it another way. It, it, we're chameleons in a sense. And, and we're, we're always responding to the situation at hand. And that situation is going to shift. It's a shifting, constantly shifting kind of thing, standing on one of those balancing things. And that's only the, the, the really deep nuanced stuff. Um, obviously, it's easy to kind of ignore all of that if you're just kind of bland on the surface. But that's one of the things that I tend to think about because I am on social media as my business and also just because I really love being there and I tend to just I'm pretty relaxed in a lot of ways the other thing is that I think that when we're in business we learn how we we engage with and communicate with our clients and I tend to just be very much myself in the office too so it's a little bit easier for me to translate perhaps um, there was one other thing that I wanted to say, and I've just lost what that was. So I'll yeah, think of it, and I'll come back later. Back to it later, if you like. Great, but that's that's the deal, though, David. And I'm not trying to get philosophical here, but at the same time, it 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 goes really well with what we're talking about. Is you know, do you become a chameleon, like Gina just pointed out, which I agree to some degree with her on that particular deal, which means if you become a chameleon, that's not you. Because uh, if you're actually going to be, well, to a degree, it, it could be, Gina, it could be. If you need to change the way you are for the sake of appeasing, if you will, somebody because they don't understand jokes, you are not being yourself. That doesn't mean, see, I think what the underlying problem here is this, that we're talking about engagement to a degree to have people like us. That, that basically most people would like everybody else to understand them and to like them. That's a normal reaction. Mm. But at the same time, that's just not the way the world works. You're not going to have everybody like you. You know, as they say, you may fool some people some of the time, all people some of the time, but not all people all the time. It just doesn't work like that. So that means that if I'm actually stating something, I'm not talking about being, you know, being understood wrong or whatever. In this particular case, it, it was what was said was said. It wasn't anything negative said. In terms of, it was a very different opinion than what the, the author of the uh, of the post was saying. It was a completely 100%, 180 degrees different from in terms of her sentiments. So I understand why she looked at me from that standpoint and, and basically jumped all over me. I, I totally understand that. You know, I, it's not anything that you know, I need anybody to explain. What I'm saying, though, is that what I said was the way I normally talk, whether it's in my grandma's house or anybody else's house. It doesn't matter. That's the way I talk. Some people may not like me. And that's not necessarily okay, depending on the person. For example, if somebody who I don't know doesn't like my jokes, you know, I'm still going to sleep well just fine. If somebody like David, who, I'm considered to, who I consider to be a very dear friend, doesn't like something I did or said, that's a problem for me. Okay, I need to look at it, reevaluate it. So we're getting back. It's not about me, though. We're getting back into the whole engagement thing. And we're saying then, from the engagement standpoint, do you need to be very careful about what you do 
because part of the problem with doing engagement and, and getting into back and forth deal is you're basically wasting time. You're not accomplishing anything. You're, mm. you're irritating people. They get on you. They call you names and blah, 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 all that. You're wrong and so on and so forth. You know, one time, Gina actually was part of the conversation, which we're not going to bring in your names other than that in there. But if you remember, Gina, I put a comment in there saying, let's just agree to disagree. And the response I got back was, no, I'm not going to agree to disagree. You're wrong. Remember that? Yes. This is, this is exactly the kind of stuff I'm talking about, where people simply refuse to, quote, unquote, agree to disagree. They get into much more personal. And of course, then it can escalate, gets bad. So going back to what I wanted to say then, David, you know, with that being the context, is do you create engagement or do you work carefully on the engagement to make sure you do not escalate it to that degree, meaning you may not be able to be yourself, quote, unquote? That's my question. OK. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's unpack that a little bit. We create engagement for a very specific reason, uh, or two very specific reasons. Uh, on a personal level, because it allows, to, it allows us to create a kind of relationship on a business level, because it allows us to create the kind of relationships which lead to reputational value and brand reach and awareness and sales. And the path to both is the same. It's a respectful respected approach to the connection. Um, so how do we succeed in both? Well, this is where the simplicity of being you comes in. Essentially, being you doesn't mean that we get a raw, unfiltered you. It means that we get the you which is informed by the core values which don't change. So you know, the raw and filtered you perhaps in the kind of engagement where somebody goes, no, no, you know, I don't want to agree to disagree, I want to discuss this because you're wrong, might be to say, well, you know, why don't you just take a flying jump because I haven't got time to discuss this and we already agreed to disagree on this and you know anybody who's reasonable would just let it go, but you won't, so you're being unreasonable. So you may want to say that, but, you know, there's nothing to be gained by that. You know, we have to remember that in a public public domain we're all responsible for, and also the domain we actually create the broken win <coughs> excuse me the blo broken windows syndrome and I'm talking about Microsoft Windows <laughs> is very much in effect here so uh, you know if we create a lot of negativity then we are associated with our negativity and I think that's that's a reflection of our core values if that's what we want to do it'll come through if we yeah. want our core values to be the world we want to see, we want positivity, we want change, we want things to work smoothly, we want to understand people and be understood, never mind if they like us or not, then we have to work differently. And irrespective of how we address specific situations, if they're informed by those core values, then there's going to be a consistency in all of them. So the chameleon effect that Gina spoke about is only a superficial one. You know, we sort of ad adapt to the situation. Yeah. But we don't really change. We're still yes. us. Adapting to the a chameleon is only adapting to its environment. It's not changing its essence. It's okay. just learning how to how to navigate situation and placement. So um, it doesn't mean you're not. It really does not mean you've, you've foraken yourself. That you're not yourself. Yeah. So the moral. And then there's also the pause. I just want to mention this all like too. Uh, this I remembered what I wanted to say earlier. Learning how to not be reactive, I think, is one of the most powerful lessons from engagement. Learning how to how to pause before responding whenever you're not sure what to say, and you can kind of feel those those the impulses of the raw self coming up that you wouldn't say to your husband or your best friend or, you know, anybody, you know, the things that you need to filter out. Taking a moment, you know, that's one of the cool things about all of us being in different time zones and things happening at different times, actually, we get the opportunity to take a moment or to walk away and come back. Okay, so what I'm getting from that is basically only deal with people who are in different time zone. Make sure you have enough time so you don't overreact. They got it. Um, no, actually, getting back <laughs> that, to I told you, that's you, exactly it. You get me so I well. It. I like, got it. I know. I know. Uh, but the thing I was going to mention was that. So the idea is, you know, seriously now. Uh, I, I don't know if I can do this seriously, but let's try it. Um, <laughs> the idea is that you definitely want to give some thought to whatever you're going to say. Number one, in terms of both the context of the conversation and the uh, the people you're dealing with, 
you're keeping that in mind. And at the same time, the engagement level needs to be something that would be, I guess, the easiest way to describe it would be it needs to be beneficial to all parties. Yes. If you still yep. are going to say something that's going to benefit both you and the person you're talking to and anybody else reading it, then it's a worthwhile thing to do, even though it may like be a that. difference of opinion. But if it's not, if somebody in the conversation who is intelligent and thoughtful, not just because they're doing it because they can, uh, then 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 you need to kind of, like you said, take a pause, think about what you're going to say, and see if it's even worthwhile at all to continue. Because like I said, part of this whole engagement thing is, on one hand, you do want to engage. On the other hand, you don't want to waste the time. There's only so much time. And yeah, so if you're, talking, if you're getting into back and forth with somebody and you're not really accomplishing anything, you're wasting time. You're not Nothing is getting done. Everybody gets irritated, or at least some people get irritated, and that's so it's definitely a worthless deal. So let's get back again to engagement then. Hopefully everybody agrees with me on that point. If we're getting back to the engagement from the SEO standpoint, David, is there any SEO benefits to doing comments, which is engaging with people and things like that? Yes, absolutely. And let's unpack them because I think um, Jason Darrell had a few questions on that as well. So let's unpack. <clears throat> I mean, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Let's find out why. The reason why engagement in terms of comments is so important is because um, search engines actually look at the profiles of the people who engage. They look at their own domain expertise of the person who actually does it. They look at their own commenting history. And then they begin to go into sentiment analysis. And then they begin to think, OK, this is great. You know, a piece of content generate this kind of discussion. It was overall positive. It reflects on that person. The person posted about a particular website. And it goes on. So. The answer is yes, because it helps create validation independent of your own website, because whatever you say about yourself is going to be good. Uh, but having that kind of validation in terms of comments and citations and interactions in, social, in a social media environment absolutely helps. The deeper question, of course, is, OK, if you have a kind of, in, the kind of validation in a social media environment, should you always seek it there, or should you also seek <clears throat> to have some kind of engagement interaction on your own website, which at the end of the day is your own platform. Um, the answer to that one is you should do both, perhaps. Uh, the reason you should do both is because the audience you're targeting, uh, and I use targeting in a soft sense of the word here, um, is basically um, you're working different kind of uh, contexts, not different pressures of time. Some people may feel quite comfortable um, sort of interacting and engaging in a post on G Plus or Facebook or Twitter because they don't have time to go to a particular website, but they will go on later. And some want their comments to be on record on that particular article linked to the website. Um, either is good. Both are great. <clears throat> you should be looking at both and should definitely be linking linking um, what you're doing in one to what you're doing in the other. But, but in terms of the comments themselves, I mean, we know that posts themselves definitely have a SEO presence. But do comments also, does Google index comments in any way? Yes, it does. And um, case in point, not too long ago, I was actually doing a Google search um, for something in particular. It was a particular YouTube video I wanted to find. Um, not that particular, not particular in terms that I wanted what I, I knew what I was looking for, but I knew the subject matter. So <clears throat> I went on YouTube and I did the search, and um, a whole lot of irrelevant stuff came up um, with you know what I was looking for had to do with martial arts. So I went on Google search, and I did the search there. And uh, the video I was looking for, <coughs> excuse me, actually came up. Now, what is interesting is that it came up, not because the video itself had been optimized, it hadn't, but because a couple of comments actually mentioned the subject matter that I was looking for. So basically, the comments on YouTube made a video show up on Google search, and it was exactly the kind of thing I needed to, to find. And that shows the value of that comments actually have. Um, it used to be that comments gave us additional keywords. People worry that if you have comments, well, they will water down the content of your article. Um, Google looks at the content which is user-generated differently to the content that is on the web page itself. Uh, and because it does that, it assesses those two differently, and it stresses user in its guidelines. It should try to get both. If you have user-generated user content, it has great value in terms of search. It has great value in terms of what you're doing on the web, um, and you know you should always seek it whenever whenever you can. Gotcha. Okay. So in terms of in terms of let's let's let me ask another question then. In terms of the um, 
David's losing his voice, which is not a good good sign here. Uh, <laughs> I've got I've got a, a bit of a cold and cold, yeah, me. You know. yeah. uh, so anyway, um, in terms of this engagement, then is you know you're going to put some things business wise. Obviously, it's understandable. Do you think there is any value at all from a business perspective to get to people to do some engagement on a personal level? In other words, if you're only looking to benefit the business side of it and and you're trying to get some SEO traction by engaging people that way, does it make any sense to engage in any other way which may have nothing to do with the business? Um, <clears throat> no, I mean, if you have engagement which is um, non-contextual, let's say, um, that will not help you very much. And again, let's say, a classic example, let's try and game the system. Let's say you put up a post, and on that post, you know, you talk about specific stuff which you do with uh, servers and computers and systems, and you ask me to help you. Now, if I come and comment on that, because I actually am subject relevant, that will help. But if I bring in my uh, 10,000 friends from the fitness community to come and help you on that, and all they ever post about is, uh, bodybuilding and lifting and diets, well, that won't help you. Even if they comment s relatively um, specifically by, you know, looking and sort of perusing very much, just because their profiles are not linked to anything else like that. They haven't got a history of um, commenting like this. So really the key to engagement always is relevance, because that's what you're actually trying to, to um, get across. You're trying to get across to search that what you've actually created is so relevant that people who are specifically targeted on this or um, engaged in the kind of thing are willing to spend time and effort interacting and engaging. Okay. Um, I think you know there's definitely value. It's not just SEO related. I mean, basically, if you're looking to get some business without interacting with people on a personal level, it's very difficult to establish the rapport that's necessary to conduct business, to establish the trust and everything else. So I think, you know, it's definitely not, I don't think it's a good idea to just do nothing but business-related discussions and nothing else, like nothing else exists. Yes, you're going to save some time by not engaging with people on anything else, but at the same time, people don't get to know you. And if they don't know you, then they're not going to be doing business with you. So there's a little bit of a give and take, I think, with that in terms of the whole trust element coming into the play. And... Um, you know, a lot of this stuff, obviously, on a personal level, it's interesting what Gina said. She engages because she likes it. It's not necessarily she's trying to do something business-related, which always helps, too. But at the same time, she just likes it. She likes to talk to people just like we normally engage in normal life uh, offline. I mean, it's not no different. You're just doing it differently. But I think what the difference, though, is is this deal with when people um, do engage, then, you know, they have a certain – there's always certain element of – some kind of purpose. I mean, they, I think it's important to have some sort of purpose why you're engaging with somebody. And sometimes it could be some kind of trigger that's important to you, you know, uh, whether it's politics, whether it's, uh, you know, sports, whether it's, uh, you know, somebody who is a friend of you. I mean, a lot of times I would put something, if I see something that, something that Gina, Gina shared, for example, and I have a lot of respect for Gina, I would engage just because it's Gina. Not because of anything else, not because necessarily of the topic or because of the comments made, but just because I want to. It's almost like a way of saying hi to, to some degree, you know, to kind of see that, you know, Gina can see that I'm still alive and still kicking because we don't do a lot of stuff one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So I think it's, it's the engagement thing is also important from just similar kind of uh, approach as you do in, in offline real life. I mean, it, it, I think it works in, in a similar way. And I think, but I think the difference is that we're much different because this this online barrier, if you will, I think creates a situation where we're much more quick to say something we normally would not say, not because we're not in grandma's house, but just something like if I met Gina, as an example, on the street, I would not, even if she said something that I may disagree with, I don't think I'd immediately say something that I might say online. Why? Because the element of um, there, there is basically there is I, the, the care is not there. In other words, if I'm talking to Gina person to person, there's a certain amount of connection that doesn't seem to be the same way online. And all I have to do is, you know, if I want to say something negative, I can say it, and I can just close the mute the post. I don't even have to hear anything anymore. So I think this ease of being able to do how we do it, 
it makes the engagement sometimes more um, lesser of what it should be. I, that's what I really mean to say yeah. because of this ease of being able to just say, I don't really care. You know, if I say something, somebody doesn't like it, who cares? Do you agree with this, yes. both June and David, or not? Um, I agree that there are people on the web who are um, reputationally you know, not as invested in what they do as others. Um, the biggest change we've had over the last three, four years is this unification of what we do across the web in all the different digital profiles we have and in all the different activities. Whether we do it anonymously or not, that unification is beginning to build up reputational value, uh, which a lot of people value. Um, so they're less inclined to be aggressive, perhaps, just for the sake of being aggressive. So what we usually call trolling uh, tends to happen less and less, which makes it all the more noticeable when it actually does happen. But at the end of the day, when it does happen in, in such a way, it has zero value either for the person doing it or the person receiving it and engaging in it has no point um, and that's something we need to bear in mind. Um, the engagement discussion has to be relevant when it is personal as you said and the web can also be personal because we are multi-layered um, as people who we just are not one-dimensional um, then again it, you know it, it is different in context different in tone but it's no less uh, respectful in many ways because it's still a public platform um, and as you say it is even more respectful it takes place in a very private environment whether it's offline or online you know like an online chat for instance between two people um, so these are the things which um, define engagement in general and in terms of value to a business or a person or a brand it's the ability to actually um, reach a wide audience uh, impact upon them sufficiently for them then to have activity to engage in activity which is beneficial in terms of uh, surfacing the website, um, casting a vote of trust, if you like, in terms of how they perceive it, uh, citing it afterwards, uh, mentioning it, and generally in their comments creating positive sentiment as opposed to negative. Okay. Gina, let me ask Gina real quick. Gina, in your oh. opinion, do you like more the concept of creating engagement from your own content or do you like more the concept of engaging on somebody else's content? Wow, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> I happen to like both. Um, even when I was making art, I always liked to be making art that's, that was in response to things that I found. So I'm always really interested in what other people are thinking about, and um, it brings up things I might not have thought of. So that stimulation is really exciting to me. So I really enjoy commenting and engaging with people on their content and going to kind of their territory with them. But I also just absolutely adore when there's engagement on my own content. I mean, that's just one of the most thrilling things that I've ever experienced, frankly. Um, to spend time and invest my energy in creating a piece of content and then having it spark energy from another human being and curiosity and conversation is just, I mean, what could be better, really? So while I value both, I think that I get more, I may get more personal thrill <laughs> when it's my own. I mean, you know, whenever you get response for your creativity, it's just, it's, it's wonderful because the whole intention is to have a conversation. So when the conversation actually happens, it's just like, pay dirt, you know, that's the gold often. Um, I'm always really curious, just back to what you were, I hope you don't mind me backtracking a little bit, but I'm always curious about people that come online who do feel that they can run away and not take responsibility for what they've said. And, you know, I, I'm curious about what they're like in their life offline too. And what I always imagine is that there's kind of this sloppy behavior. And I don't know, maybe it comes from living in a fairly small city where I live, where, you know, my reputation in my community is just as important here as it is online and and how we treat people and the consciousness by which we we kind of command our language and, and interact with people is it's a constant you know, how I answer the door to the UPS guy. You know, if I don't treat him nicely, he's not going to leave treats for Tilly and Lulu. And then 
you know, there's like a whole bunch of repercussions on that. So, you know, you never know where, where and when it's important. And so I think it's my kind of, my ethic with that is that it's always important, whoever you're talking yeah, to, and, and whether it's that. online or offline. I agree. I, and that's what I was going to say. I think it's, it's the same thing that, that is online and offline. It's just like I said, online, it's a little bit easier. I think that's why a lot of people do it because they can just write whatever they want because they can. Okay, because the normal decorum does not allow them to be the way they are when they deal with somebody on the street. It just, they just, we just don't let ourselves get to that level. And online, I think people do allow themselves to do it because the medium allows them to do it easily and there's no consequences. Okay, so the guy doesn't like me, the guy doesn't like me. But I think that's, that's the reason you see it. But what I wanted to, to go back to, the reason I asked about the, the content is, you know, there is this guy who writes this incredible post every single week on Sundays, I believe it, it happens. And, um, you know, everybody hopefully who is listening here knows that David Amerlin does a stellar job in writing these Sunday reads. And I know Gina is a big fan, and I'm a huge fan. There's a lot of people who are big fans. Of uh, I, I don't about. like them at all. <laughs> and I want, well, actually, I'm going to bring up, you know, you're part of this conversation. I, I'm saying it for, on, on purpose. I'm not just um, blabbing here. Um, what I wanted to say was that um, in terms of these Sunday reads, a lot of times David and I, we're not going to get into the details or everything, but politically we're not exactly on the same page. We have some differences of opinion always respectful, you know, no question there, but we do have some differences. And some things David writes sometimes, I disagree with, so obviously, you know, I'd make my two cents here and there. But more importantly, what happens a lot of times is I do agree with him on a lot more stuff than they disagree with him on. And and the the, the Sunday reads are incredibly always thought provoking, always. David just has this incredible gift, just like Gina has a gift with, you know, art, which is amazing in my view. Uh, same thing with David and his writing. And so what happens a lot of times what I see happening, I've done it somewhat, I didn't I don't do it every week, but it seems like Gina does it a lot more than I do, where she actually shares David's Sunday read post and she writes her own thoughts on the same very subject from her own point of view. So she doesn't do any kind of rehash. But I noticed several different people do it, including myself. I've done it a number of times before. And that is that there's, it's a different deal with engagement where you don't just share somebody's stuff and just let it go because it's so easy to do and people do it all day long, including myself. You don't create your own content and, and post it and then, but you actually take somebody else's like that and then you share that with a whole write-up of your own. Gina, any thoughts about how and why people do that kind of stuff? Well, it's been an interesting experience for me, actually, and I, I have been sharing those every week for probably a, maybe a year, maybe longer, I, I don't recall. Um, I find it to be a really interesting exercise. I mean, I love the Sunday Reads, and that's where it came from, and I used to engage a lot on the Sunday Read itself and get involved in a lot of deep discussion, and that's my kind of dilemma now. I'm putting a lot of energy into the share, and then I end up not really being on the post and trying to work on that. But um, there, it's a completely different experience. And actually, no, it's not. It goes back to what I was saying earlier about really liking to have a jumping off point. Um, David happens to stimulate a certain level of, of depth in my own thinking and triggers me to go on these thinking journeys on Sunday mornings. And there's always some kind of really rich experience to be had. And what I find is that when I do my shares and I dig in deep to where he's coming from in order to find what it might mean for me or what it brings up for me or a memory or, or a philosophy or an opinion or whatever, then I've gained, you know, it's not even measurable how much more I've gained than just reading the post and commenting on the post because I've taken it and I've make it, made it my own. And there's a, there's a claiming, there's something that happens in that process that actually helps us to integrate what we're learning just so much more thoroughly. I mean, that, I think that's a lot of why I do it is because each week I get to learn something about myself and my point of view and how I regard the world that I live in. And so 
it's a it's kind of like a teaching exercise for myself in a way. Uh, I haven't really articulated it quite like this. Nobody's ever asked about it before. Um, I appreciate the question because it's a it's a it's a thing for me on Sunday mornings. I mean, it's, I definitely anticipate that every single week. And I know David's he's expanding my horizons. Yeah, and you know, to some degree, uh, you know, you can look at it as a somewhat selfish thing. You know, what's in it for me, which everybody to some degree, you know, listens to their radio station because you're taking somebody else's content who is very well written, very well thought out, and you wind up piggybacking on top of that. I'm not. Yeah, writing draft. No, no, no. I'm not saying it in a negative way, but you're then adding your own thoughts and everything else, and so you create a totally different level of engagement by using this particular approach, which brings me back, and like I said, I'm only saying it with the utmost nothing but respect. I love reading your thoughts on the subject. I completely agree in terms of the education level of you know things that you learn. It doesn't really matter whether you, whether you agree or disagree, but whatever it's stated, the bottom line is the learning is definitely in place, and the thought-provoking is in place, and, and it's, you know, for anybody who values at all any kind of... Um, personal growth and engagement, I highly recommend Sunday Reads every time. And then I also highly recommend reading some other people's um, take on it, not just with people who share it and they don't add anything, but things like Gina does, where she actually does her own write-up, um, which is, you know, may, may not be sometimes as large as David's is, as the original, but certainly very substantial. And so you wind up kind of double learning because of that. So I think it's it's wonderful from that standpoint. But that takes me back to David now. And I'm going to put David on the spot because he's afraid because I can. And that is the question is, David, since we're talking about engagement, is what is your formula, if you will, or your thoughts, if, if not a formula, to create things like the Sunday Read that create that level of both acceptance and uh, revelry and at the same time admiration and everything else and was, it creates a tremendous, you always have a tremendous amount of engagement and you're the kind of person, what I wanted to stress out is that David doesn't do a lot of talking most of the time, you know, as you do hang out, you do that and obviously you speak but most of the time when you're looking at things that you write in terms of comments and responses to people they're very short most of the time and that's of course because you're very busy so it's totally understandable but in terms of what's your approach or what's, what's part of the magic, if you will, that allows you to create, outside of you being a great writer, is there something else that allows you to create that level of people's response and people's yeah. to be able Yeah, there to is. There is. And there's, it's the same answer that um, pretty much Gina gave when you asked her whether she prefers sharing content or doing her own. Um, and ultimately, whichever activity we're engaging, whether we're sharing somebody's content or sharing our own, it has the same thing. It has to have value to us, primarily, and then to others. And if it has value to us, we really care about it. If we really care about it, well, it's not just content we just throw out there simply because we need to throw, out, throw it out there. It really means something to us. We're engaged and invested, and that gives it value, and then that has um, a reciprocal value in those who actually read it, because you know whether they agree or disagree with it, they are not left unmoved, and that's great because then we can see different perspectives, and then that makes it even more valuable. So if we take an individual post on a social media platform which has a kind of discussion, the discussion itself, as it gets longer and longer, becomes incredibly valuable because suddenly we see all these different people's eyes and minds behind the comments. It's exactly the same approach we can take in a commercial setting, in a commercial environment, with commercial engagement, commercial posts. Um, if you create posts which resonate with the audience, they basically add their passion and their response to it, and that makes it very valuable. But the post has to be valuable to you. It has to start with, I really care about what I do. I really care about what I say. I mean, really investing here, time, effort, and to a certain degree, um, a willingness to be vulnerable by being open and transparent in the things that I say. Um, and, and that is, again, um, it humanizes things. It allows it to become um, a little bit more valuable, perhaps, because of the level of humanity that's invested in it. And again, that works whether it's personal for our own benefit and our own engagement interaction, or it's commercial for our, our brand or our business. Um, these things now are becoming 
they're different by label, but they're pretty much the same in the way they operate in the online environment. You know, you need to be truthful, transparent, authentic, uh, trustworthy. You need to be all those things in order to get anywhere. And whether you're doing it as a person or you're doing it as a business, we both know that the process is the same. The scale changes, perhaps the intent may get a little bit narrower, but the process is, is exactly the same. So being both in both environments, being both in both contexts is great, and that elicits that kind of thing. So that's my number one secret, if you like. If I, if I see, see something which moves me, then I get involved in it, I think about it, I analyze it, and then it begins to have real value for me, which then begins to have real value for other people as well, because um, ultimately, we all live on the same planet, and we're all subjected to the same forces, and we all have some kind of opinion these days about how things should happen, how things should move forward, why certain things happened, and why other things keep on happening. Yeah, and, and back to the to the to what's in it for me in the writing draft on somebody else, I think that that actually doesn't function at all if the value isn't there for you and if you're yes. not passionate. It, yeah. You know, you can't use that as a formula. If, if what you're doing isn't real to you and is only resting on that very precarious little tip of something that's going to fall over, then it's not it's not going to do anything. You know, you'd be able you'd smell it from miles away if I if if I were just doing it to get something out of it. And I'm not saying you were implying that, but no, no, just no. as an example. No, 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 I, I, I respectfully disagree, Gina, because on some level, that's exactly why you're doing it. Even even whatever you're writing, whatever the reason is, however much value it is for you or anybody else, you're doing it for the self satisfaction or do, of doing things right. And, and getting a feedback that you're getting if people are saying that they like your content or they like what you have to say or whatever they say, maybe they even disagree with it, but the fact that there is a value in place, it makes you feel good. You're doing it for a reason, some sort of a reason, even if nothing more than for, to make you feel good. Otherwise, why would you be doing it? Well, but the, the impetus, the, the core of that reason is simply for me. Every, it starts with me. I'm doing it because I am yeah, going to get I something think the out for myself. You're not doing it for any kind of malicious purposes of self-gratification without any benefit to anybody else. I think that's the important thing to say. It's not that you're not doing it for you. Everything you're doing, you're doing for you in some way. It's just a question of, and this is what I you know, talk about. I hope people understand what I'm saying. It's, it's a difference between how business is conducted in America and, for example, if you look at the former Soviet Union. Over there, people would what they call step on somebody's throat to get ahead. That was the approach. That's how you got something done. Over here, people try to do whatever they can for other people in terms of better pricing, better service, better product. That's how they get ahead. But the bottom line is still they're trying to get ahead themselves, meaning they're doing something for themselves. They're just doing it with benefiting other people as well. And that's the difference between the two approaches. So I think that what's in it for me is important to a degree that you do Get, you, you're working on things to get something done for a purpose, and to some degree, it needs to benefit benefit you in some way. I mean, obviously, the paintings you created, which are amazing in my view, were created for other people. But I'm sure it gave you a certain amount of self-satisfaction doing it. Otherwise, what, you know, there's no reason to. Do it. If you absolutely hated the experience of doing your painting, you probably wouldn't do it. Is that accurate or not? It's totally accurate. And the paintings were conversations with myself first. And then they went out into the world. Yeah, and but they are always conversations with myself first. Before I actually sit down to write a share of, of David's Sunday Read, I have spent a lot of time ruminating. Sometimes I have to go off to yoga practice. I have to like do other things, and it's got to kind of assimilate into my system before I know what I want to say. So it's an experience that I'm having within my own little universe deeply before it's it's something that's created for others to see and, and hear and be privy to. And David does bring up there are so many areas of vulnerability in those Sunday reads and it's often like, okay, how personal should I be today? You know, there's always that that choice, like how much am I willing to disclose about my own vulnerabilities and my own situation here. And I, I I go through different phases with that. By the way, speaking of Sunday read sharing and stuff, uh, have you been getting David's checks on time? 
<laughs> have you what? You've been getting David's checks on time. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's the other thing. I mean, really, he just paid me to do it. But exactly. you know, we don't want to tell anybody that. All right, we'll get we'll get serious one more time for the end. This is the end of it. So in the end, David, I guess if you could kind of sum up on the engagement part in terms of what you know, just to try to make it as simple as you can in terms of how people business specific. We're not talking about personal here because personal is you know you are what you are and the way you engage the way you engage. But on the business specifically from SEO perspective and business perspective, what would you recommend people do or specifically not do in terms of trying to get obviously you know in your case I, I want to preface it a little bit in your case you have a tremendous amount of cloud right now and most of it most of, no 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 I'm serious and the reason you have cloud is because a you have tremendous amount of valuable content you put out there I mean there's a ton of stuff that you put out there that, that's seriously valuable stuff and by the way David is not paying me for this he's just paying Gina secondly uh, you wrote a number of books that obviously are totally relevant on the subject and clearly show you as somebody who needs to be followed and carefully um, appreciated properly for the things that you wrote. So that's what built up the cloud. Most of us are not writing our books, so we can't create the same cloud. And of course, because of this cloud, or the building of this cloud is also part of your 350,000 followers. So now when you put something out, it's more than 350,000, but you know, way up there basically. When you put something out, there's a lot of people that get to see it and a lot of people get to respond and you do get engagement. Even if you don't try, you're going to get engagement at this point. But I want to make it very clear that you were not born with this silver spoon, if you will, or this silver cloud. You actually made this, got yourself to this point with all your efforts in terms of your writing online, in terms of offline, you know, books, everything else. So looking at it from the engagement standpoint of small businesses and even larger businesses, what would you recommend in terms of the direction and how they should approach engagement, approach engagement, I should say, to do things correctly and try to do and get to the point they may not get the same level of you are, but at least get the engagement going properly. Okay. Well, provided you, we all approach it from the same give value to your audience angle, the first thing that goes out the window is comp compartmentalizing your content. Uh, you know, where you talk one way to one person, different way to another person, you know, that should be the same throughout. So there's no marketing to personas. You may market or send content to different interests, perhaps. And within Google+, Plus, we have collections, for instance, which specific people can follow. But if you look at posts across the collections, there's a unity to that. But beyond all that, um, you always play to your strengths. So you find the medium which best helps you um, get across what you want, and you focus there primarily, and then you take it elsewhere. For some people, it may be Instagram. Maybe their masters are taking great shots and starting a visual conversation with their audience, and that's perfectly fine for that. For some people, it may be Pinterest, because they're really good at curating content and creating unities around that. And for, for me, Personally, when I first discovered, you know, it was on day two since it was created, it was on, on Google+. Plus. I thought it was amazing. And um, it, it just gave me a platform where my passion for conversation and in-depth interaction um, could take root. And if you look at my earliest post, when I had maybe about a 1,000 followers, I was pretty much the same as I am now. So, you know, it didn't, um, I didn't sort of tailor it for an effect. The effect was the fact that I was willing to be so open and forthcoming. And to my surprise and delight, a lot of other people at the time um, did the same, which was, again, unique. I mean, we, we take it for granted now. You know, it's four years later almost, and we are seasoned veterans, and we think this is cool, and we got used to it. But roll the clock four years back. You know, SEO industry, marketing industry, everybody had secrets. They never gave anything to anybody. You know, you discovered something, you kept it close to your chest, and suddenly we had open discussions about all sorts of things. We gave data to each other. We posted publicly about things we discovered. Um, we discussed openly things which we wouldn't normally discuss, like, you know, cross-cultural politics and, and politics even, and religion and, you know, science. And suddenly it became a talking shop in, in the traditional sense of a disruptive talking shop, as in, you know, the coffee houses of London and and the speakeasies in the, in the States. So 
that allowed us to do it. So um, what you do is you find your strength, you find your passion, and you merge those two together. And you make it work for you. And once it begins to work in one area, then it gives you traction, which begins to work in another. And you've got to remember whatever social media platform you are on, with the exception perhaps of Facebook, it is visible to search. Uh, Facebook is, you know, you're one layer deep only. Um, but anything else, you know, Pinterest will help you, LinkedIn will help you, Twitter will help you, um, you know, Google Plus will definitely help you. Okay, Gina, final thoughts on the same subject? I think she's uh, frozen on my screen. Gina? Okay, so Gina doesn't get the last word after all. All right. <laughs> no. No, is she coming back? No, no it doesn't look like she's coming back. Okay. Um, if she comes back, we'll give her the last word. Okay, David, thank you uh, for um, being here, obviously, today and for everything that you do. My immense, always very much appreciate it. And, um, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if uh, at this point in time is it uh, okay to can you say anything about the new book that's coming out or it's too early? I can't just yet. Um, we've okay. just sort of fi finalized uh, a couple of clauses in the contract and um, the I haven't yet got the okay from the legal people so I I no can't problem. say anything yeah, yeah, until I'm much until I from them. So, yes. okay, so, just, so everybody knows that there is a new book that David is uh, going to be publishing soon and he can't say anything yet, obviously, sounds like, but he will as soon as uh, that happens. Oh, Gina, Gina's back. Gina's back. Yeah, sorry about that. A plane went over and my connection went away. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <Related. laughs> so Gina engages with planes now. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, in addition to that, obviously, you know, if you don't have the SEO help book, definitely very much recommend you get that from davidamerlin.com and from Amazon, you know, whatever you buy books, you can get it, it's everywhere. And then, of course, his newest book on trust, not, that's not the new one that's coming out, that's the last book that came out, and that's out, um, and so you can pick that up uh, also anywhere, including davidamerlin.com. You can also definitely check out the website itself. There is always excellent articles that come out from time to time. Um, David does not kill you with a zillion different articles that mean nothing. There's always very specific, very pertinent articles. A lot of times they have to do with similar to you know, the books that he has. So it kind of works really well together. Uh, very well, ni nicely done website. Highly recommend it. And um, so now that Gina is back, Gina, I just wanted to see if you wanted to say a few words as we wrap this up about what your approach is to trying to create engagement when it comes to small business, like small business that you own, and if you have any words of wisdom on that in addition to what David said. I, I think what I would say is it's a constant learning experience, and, and I'm always watching and listening and trying to find better ways to communicate with people and to create more engagement, and, you know, I hope to get better at it. You know, I hope to get a whole lot better at it. Um, I, I think it's been a really, I've been online doing this and I came on, stumbled onto Google Plus three years ago. And David was actually one of the first people I met. And I still remember that conversation about him walking by the pier and meeting a fisherman and trying to talk to him about what he does. And, and that was what we struck up a conversation about. And I was talking about my Zen Cohen group and, and how they don't seem to be interested in my online life. You know? And... Um, what I've learned, I, one of the deepest things that, that's happened to me during all of this is it's helped me with shyness. And I've really seen a lot of change even in how I am communicating and engaging with people not online, but on the ground here. I don't like to say in real life because I think it's all real. But I think that the two territories really inform each other. And the more that we allow our external world to inform how we behave online, the more authentic we can be and the more we'll inspire engagement and conversations with people. And I tend to get very comfortable with the people that I already know and sometimes I have a hard time striking out towards new people and that's something that I challenge myself with. So. Okay. Great, thank you very much. And Gina, you're, uh, since we're doing shameless plugs here, your website is fedeyesdevelopment.com, right? 
No, it's FatEyes.com. Oh, FatEyes.com. Okay. Yeah. And Gina, uh, she has a company that does websites for businesses. And uh, anything else on the websites, Gina? Um. Yep. Yeah, we're we're Cobbler's Children. We've been really trying to get a new site up for the longest time and never having enough time for it. But we're getting closer, and we're really excited. Our site's outdated at this point, and we're really looking forward to having a fresh presence. Um, but yeah, you can see our work there. We have a portfolio and you can read some of our philosophy and how we work with clients. And I think get a pretty good sense of what it's like to work with us, which is our main aim on the on the site. Great, great. So you can see the fedice.com and you can obviously find Gina on Google Plus, same with David. And uh, the bottom line is uh, when you write your stuff to be engaging, do not be condescending, do not be illogical. Um, do not be wrong, okay, let me just say that, and at the same time, be yourself. And with that, thank you very much. Again, thanks a lot, David Amerland and Gina Fidel. Bye, thanks. Have both of you here. Take and, care. Uh, until next time, um, we'll be working on episode eight shortly, so there's only 13 steps left. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.